Okay, ready? Yes. Hello, and welcome back to the podcast. My name is Chris Ferry, and of course, this is my co-host. My name is Chris Huddleston. And today we are very excited to be talking to you about a brand new movie, brand spanking new movie um, out on Netflix now. Don't look up. So do you have a synopsis for us, Mr. Huddleston? I do. This comes from Rotten Tomatoes. So Don't Look Up is a 2021 film, I believe released on Christmas Day or some somewhere around there, Christmas Eve, Christmas Day to Netflix. So a little warning, we typically spoil stuff. I think we're going to not spoil the ending but we'll we'll probably spoil a lot else so if this is something if a political satire is something that appeals to you then maybe watch it and and come back later uh, if you want to hear what we have to say so the synopsis is kate dibiase played by jennifer lawrence an astronomy grad student and a professor dr randall mindy leonardo dicaprio make an astounding discovery of a comet orbiting within the solar system the problem, it's on a direct collision course with Earth. The other problem, no one really seems to care. With only six months until the comet makes impact, managing the 24-hour news cycle and gaining the attention of the social media-obsessed public before it's too late proves shockingly difficult. What will it take to get the world to just look up? So this was directed by Adam McKay, and in addition to Leonardo DiCaprio and Jennifer Lawrence, it also stars Meryl Streep, Rob Morgan, Jonah Hill, Kate Blanchett, and a bunch of other people. So, all right, Chris, what did you think of it? Just to reiterate, we're going to spoil at least part of this. We won't have to tell you exactly about the ending, but, you know, if you want to watch it, then go watch it. Don't listen to this. Um, I mean, I, I found it entertaining. I, I, I thought um, certainly as a star-studded cast. Um, I thought it was funny. I thought the satire was biting. Um, it was, I mean, the satire was so biting, I found it really upsetting. <laughs> you know, it, it chimes. Not that there is uh, necessarily a meteor going to hit the earth in six months, but um, it's certainly uh, sending up climate change and uh, sort of alternate facts and two different how, how science and truth has been politicized and how, uh, you know, it can be crazy making in today's world. And I think so as, as much as I enjoyed the performances of, of a really stellar cast, I, I did find it, I found it kind of upsetting and sort of, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't love the term triggering, but it, it was kind of triggering in some ways where, I was making me like my heart palpitate stuff mm -hmm. because I thought this is just crazy. Does nobody see what's happening here? What did you think? Yeah, so um, a, a couple of the two main criticisms that I've seen of this film, just reading a little bit about it online is that it's mean spirited and that it's too on the nose. And my response to that personally is Political satire is tends to be mean spirited, I think. Um, but to me, it's just kind of my personal rules of what I of comedy, just what I think is, it's not really mean spirited if you're punching up. And this movie is, I would say, ninety five percent punching up. You know, they're going after, they're satirizing politicians, the Pentagon, the media, social media. TV pundits, which I think those are all fair game, you know, uh, punching down, I, you know, if you're making fun of people who are mentally and physically challenged, you know, that's not funny. That's, that's, that is just cruel and, and mean. And this film is not doing that. I suppose you could say there's a scene kind of late in the movie where there's a rally for, so Meryl Streep is the president in this. And they, you know, there's a comet heading towards earth and it that comet is they view as being bad for her uh, political campaign for the next, you know, she's running for president again or whatever. And so they, this movement comes along, the don't look up movement, where basically the people are just going to pretend that the comet doesn't exist and it's not going to happen. Well, wait, in, oh, in, respo ahead. in response at one point to the scientific community, like at, at one point, the 
the the meteor or the comet or the meteor approaching the earth is visible in the daytime yeah. sky it looks like a comet heading for the earth right it's you can't miss it it's bigger than your hand yeah. and they're saying just look up <laughs> like you, you're hearing that this is a hoax literally just look up and look at the thing heading towards our planet that wasn't there you know months ago mm -hmm. and in response to that the deniers start their own chant which is don't look up and they have pins that say don't look up and hats that have an arrow pointing down don't look up which is of course absurd on its face because they're trying to get these people literally to never raise their heads right like, and, and look up at the sky and it, there's a point at a rally in which one guy sort of accidentally does look up and he's like oh hey they've been lying to us <laughs> like, yeah and exactly and that was kind of the only and sees that, it that was kind of the only incident where i could think of where it was kind of like okay these are just regular people at a rally and maybe they're you know the the film is saying that they're stupid or whatever but at least that guy has the realization of, oh, hey, they lied to us. Um, and so then you get into the, is it too on the nose? And maybe it is to a degree, but I think we are in such crazy times right now where it's almost like reality is on the nose, if that makes sense. You know, we've had pundits just in the last week or so be upset about what Minnie Mouse is wearing and the uh, m and what M&Ms, the cartoon M&Ms are wearing. So it's, you know what I mean? It's like we're in this, and there's a, there's a, uh, w there's a lot of little mini jokes in this film that, you know, there's some great lines in this, but there are a lot of little mini jokes that are pretty subtle. Uh, I don't know if you noticed, there's one point where there's a couple of different times in the film and they don't say anything about this, but you can see in the background, um, signs in stores that shovels are five hundred dollars uh and then i think there's one point where it's like shovels are five thousand dollars um but towards the end of the movie they never use real media in this so there's uh, they show what would be pbs a few times in like uh sesame street but it's pbn and you know fox news and cnn they don't it's not the real names but there's towards the very end of the movie where the comet is is hurtling towards earth and there's a guy who would ba basically be the fox news commentator and literally as the as the comet is coming down they're showing this guy in times square on a big screen and he says tonight's top story topless um nursing topless nursing homes <laughs> and it's like that's exactly what our media is right now you know what i mean the the onion has gotten to where you know the onion has almost I think gone under because the satire of the onion can't compete with real life. Right. You know what I mean? You, Does that make you sense? Can, yeah. You can't satirize this stuff. Yeah. It's like, it, it used to be things like, you know, Senator says uh, absurd thing. Right. And that was the kind of article. And now it's like senators are saying even more absurd things that if it was an onion article 10 years ago, you wouldn't have found it plausible as an onion article exactly you know, been like that's not funny because nobody would ever say anything that absurd and we've i think what's crazy making about it now is that's routine right mm -hmm. that 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 experience of somebody saying something absurd or even overtly criminal and there is no like we've acclimated to it now we've all just sort of adjusted to it and we're all still sailing along. Yeah. Um, um, go ahead, sorry. No, I, so I think, I think on the nose, on the nose seems to me like um, it's a valid criticism because it is so on the nose that it inhibits my, you know, it's a satire. So it's billed as a comedy and I think we, I, I go on this rant a lot, but I think that, you know, one of the litmus tests I hold up to whether or not I want to kind of thumbs up or thumbs down one of the movies we watch is, was it entertaining? Was it enjoyable? Mm 
um, in some way, like Schindler's List was not enjoyable, like a fun roller coaster ride, but Schindler's List was entertaining in the sense that it was a really uh, uh, affecting drama, right? right. So it, that you're like, wow, wow. Um, and I do think that this was on the nose enough that it inhibited my taking pleasure in the comedy like some of the stuff some of the laughs just actually the, the stuff that i thought was funniest in this was like jonah hill being he's really great i thought being just an absolute schmuck and some of the verbal stuff that it almost felt improv back and forth between him and the jennifer lawrence character i thought made me laugh because that wasn't really big picture stuff that was just the riffing I thought it was, there was great. a great line with him while, while you're bringing him up. There's one part where they're having a rally. And so he is the what? He's the secretary of state, I think. And he's the son of the president of Merrill right. Street. So there's one one uh, part where they have a rally and he comes out to speak. And he's talking about how they have to all get together to fight the other side. And, and he says, you know, it'll be uh, all of you blue collar regular americans and us the cool rich people you know and that's basically like his attitude of everything is he's he's very elitist uh but he has some funny lines along you know along those lines that that i really liked yeah yeah i you know and i i like this send up of the kind of big tech guru who is in a kind of an amalgamation of the Jeff Bezos and the Steve Jobs and the Bill Gates of our world. Elon who, Musk. Who, yes, who is played, um, who, who, you know, who, who has a company that is sort of Google-esque mm -hmm. that has run all of these AI predictions and they, they purportedly know everybody's buying habits and preferences and even how everyone's going to die. <laughs> like it has gamed it out. Yeah. Uh, there was a great line about him uh, <laughs> about halfway through the movie where they, he's brought in to the, so he is a major donor to the president. So they kind of put him at the front of the line of decision-making and Jennifer Lawrence and, and, uh, and Leonardo DiCaprio are these two scientists that have, they have this, actually, she discovered that this comet is heading toward earth and kind of the gist of the movie. I felt like what Adam McKay is saying is that's very relevant to what happened is happening now is can we just listen to scientists? So, you know, they're the two people that know the most what's going to happen, basically. And then another guy from NASA. But there are all these other people making decisions that aren't necessarily the right decisions. But there's a scene where the this tech guru guy is going to meet with the president and Jennifer Lawrence doesn't know who he is. And she's like, he looks really familiar. Where do I know him from? And Leonardo DiCaprio says, oh, he was the guy who bought the Gutenberg Bible and then he lost it. I don't know. That's, that line really made me laugh, you know. Uh, yeah, you know, it's. There's a part of me that wondered, like, what what will we say this movie is about? Because obviously it's about um, you know, a meteor, a kind of a world ending meteor colliding with the planet but on the human level it's I thought it was sort of really about how we as human beings handle and I think particularly as Americans like we us this audience American Netflix audience um this is this movie is completely from an American viewpoint. I mean, yes. there are little nods to other countries, but we we never see right. what any other country really is doing about this. And it's you know, it's going to affect the entire world, obviously. And uh, I, I just think it's how we respond to a crisis. And I think there is there's something in there that implies that it's not just it's not just an evil ogliarchy and an evil corrupt media and corrupt politicians that are 
ruining our lives. But somehow those things are symptoms of a system in which we mostly just want to put our head in the sand and get on it. We collectively, we just want to get on with our life. So at every level, right? Because the president is this venal blonde. I mean, it's Trump, you know, mm -hmm. it's uh, it, uh, primarily concerned with ratings in the next cycle where you're like, well, in six months, all life on earth will be destroyed. So your next campaign cycle, you can see how that's not really relevant if we don't stop this. And, and incapable of seeing the picture, the bigger picture at that scale, right? And the decay, and how we all deal with crisis, the Jennifer Lawrence character kind of goes to pieces, like falls into despair and hysterics. Um, the uh, Leonardo DiCaprio character ends up having a, uh, a kind of a whirlwind tryst with um, a glamorous uh, news anchor that's played Kate by Kate Blanchett, who I think steals the movie. She's I great. Think that, yeah. that performance was one of my favorite of the movie. Um, yeah, she's excellent. And, and that personality type too, that personality type where she sort of, he wants to get to know her and she doesn't understand why that's relevant, mm -hmm. but she indulges him and kind of gives him her 15 second resume, speaks four languages, you know, Oxford, uh, like just, she's this incredibly brilliant, high achieving person. Um, and it's not, it's not immediately clear why she's deciding to have an affair with this guy, except it's clear that she's not the kind of person that judges her. Like she just goes with it because she thinks it's fun for whatever reason and doesn't analyze it. And so in one, in one way, it's this enlightened image of a person that doesn't get caught up in her head about mm -hmm. what she wants. And on the other side of it, um, you have, this person who has a platform to try and make change and just decides, well, nothing we do, there's a sort of a nihilism to it, right? Like she, she considers herself smart enough to have realized that nothing we do has any consequence morally or ethically or anything anyway, that that's all an illusion. So you might as well, <laughs> you know, do what you want and get ahead for yourself and take the ride. Mm -hmm. And that stuff isn't overtly explored in the film. It's just explored through these kind of relationships and conversations in, in little quick sort of almost side scenes. But that, that also, and there's a couple of other examples, that also um, was one of my favorite things about this movie, that it, it took a look at how different folks different characters in different walks of life approach this idea of it becoming increasingly undeniable that the end was nigh, right? Yeah. And what do you want to do with your time? And some people being unable to do anything but continue with their day-to-day -day lives, miserable or not. Other people going completely to pieces and destroying or risking the good things they have in some pursuit of something that they do or don't realize is futile. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's an exploration at some levels of the human condition. And I actually really dug that. Um, yeah. Did you, did, was that something that you were clocking to or? Yeah, definitely. So i so Adam McKay was the, was the writer and the director of this. And Adam McKay has done things like Anchorman and uh, The Big Short and a bunch of other films. But um, I felt like he was, I mean, I think he clearly wants you to uh, view Jennifer Lawrence and Leonardo DiCaprio as, DiCaprio as the people who are most correct in this film because, and the most... Um, I don't know if good is the right term that I want to use, but that, you know, their kind of through line in this is that it's just, they want people to listen that, that everybody's going to die, you know, if they don't do something to fix this and they're, and they get increasingly frustrated as to, um, you know, nobody is listening. 
this is what's going to happen. Everybody's just sort of doing their thing. And I imagine that that's probably how Adam McKay has maybe viewed the last couple of years of our society with the pandemic and, and other things. But even though they are the the real protagonists in this, they still have flaws, like you brought up the affair that Leonardo DiCaprio has. And also there's a scene, there's a couple of scenes in the movie where he he becomes this celebrity and he gets wrapped up in that at times. And, and you know, there are times where he kind of forgets what his main goal and mission is. He right. gets all wrapped up in that. And there's even a scene where there's one scene where I, I, before the affair starts where he's at home and his wife wants him to go on a walk with him. And he's like, no, I'm on, you know, he's on some type of social media and he's arguing with people on there. Right. You know, he's calling somebody an idiot or whatever. And he's like, I have 250,000 followers. I have to, you know, I have an obligation to them or whatever. So, you know, he's definitely making a statement about how we all get wrapped up in social media and the same thing with Jennifer Lawrence. Can you hear me? Yeah, no, I'm oh, just okay. saying it's like oh, we I all thought, get I think, yeah. we all get wrapped up in this headspace that is literally virtual. Right? Yeah. It's not what people are saying, what strangers are saying about us on Twitter or whatever in these arguments we're getting into. Some somebody calls his science or his assertions bogus, right? And he's like, Well, you wouldn't know it, right? So he's having this. Yeah. It, so, I have an obligation to my audience and it's all his it, meanwhile his wife wants to take a walk with him which is concrete and a relationship that's real in his life and he backburners that for this virtual forum that he has come to believe has great meaning and import in his life it's all virtual baloney it's like these are people that you would never you would just never meet face to face in your life right. you couldn't meet all those people and even as smart as he is and as virtuous as he is in a lot of ways as far as wanting you know people to listen he still follows into the trap of that and you also have jennifer lawrence there's a, a kind of a continuous gag that they keep coming back to where the first time they go to the white house they're they haven't had anything to eat you know they fly on this military plane for hours to get there and a general <laughs> comes up to them and gets them some chips and some bottles of water. And he's like, oh, it's 10 bucks or whatever it is. And they give him the money. And then later, Jennifer Lawrence- And he doesn't goes, have change, right? He says, yeah. oh, he's like, you sorry, I don't have any change. And they go, forget it, don't worry about it. So then a little bit later, Jennifer Lawrence goes into a little break room and uh, she goes and gets a bottle of water out of the refrigerator and there's yeah. a woman sitting in there. This is in the White House. In the White, in House. the White House, right. Yeah. So she goes into a little break room, gets a bottle of water, and there's a woman sitting in there. And she's like, how much is this? And she goes, oh, it's free. It's the White House. Well, Jennifer Lawrence is really, so the the this general, you know, just ripped them off. Five-star the general, like of, on the on the chiefest, joint chiefs of staff or whatever. Yeah. He rips them off for 20 bucks or whatever it is. And she's like, what kind of person? Like the whole movie, she's trying to figure out who does that? And, the, and there will be these big, you know, there are these big, really important things happening. And throughout the movie, she just keeps saying, I can't believe, I just still can't believe that he ripped us off. <laughs> you know, so even she has, you know, these little petty it's just things like, it that she's concerned with. It can't with. be about the money. He's a five-star general. Yeah. You know, it's like. <laughs> so I really yeah. liked those little touches that he, you know, the. And some of the characters in this maybe are, you know, Meryl Streep is pretty, not her performance, but I, I think her character is a little underwritten. You know, there's not really a whole lot for her to do. True. But he does give these little human uh, touches to these characters that that I really liked and, you know, kind of, kind of goes along with what you were saying. Um, one thing that I wanted to say is with Leonardo DiCaprio, I don't know if you this is something that happens with you or not, but he is an actor that I really like him. I, he's a great actor and I realize that, but he's one of those actors that doesn't do a lot of films that I'm super interested in. Like the, I don't care anything about like the departed and the aviator and all those kind of things. And he's done so many heavy dramas that I think it's fun to see him in 
because he's a really great comedic actor. You know, uh, you, I mean, I would definitely say one of my favorite Leonardo DiCaprio films is Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And he's yeah. really, that's not just a straight up comedy, but he's really funny in that. And so. Um, I'm surprised. You know, Sorry to interrupt, but I'm, I'm surprised. No, no. So do you, did you not see The Departed? I saw it. It's just. It's just kind of not. I saw it in the movie theater, not, but it's not a. I'm not a big Scorsese fan in general. Huh. Wow. Um, Surprises yeah. Surprises me. Because I'm not that. I'm not that big on like mob stuff. I guess I would say. Um, so. And I, you. You had told me that you have not seen. Um, Revenant. I've not seen the Revenant. No. Yeah. I, I know feel like. I feel like he's, as he's this sort of, past the most recent chapter of his career he has really done some remarkable work um yeah and it's not that i think the work is bad or anything it's just it's just not like for example um you have you know he he did uh once upon a time in hollywood with brad pitt i like brad pitt a lot i i think leonardo DiCaprio is clearly a better actor than brad pitt is but I would say there are more Brad Pitt movies that I enjoy than Leonardo DiCaprio movies. Like, yeah. I love Seven and I love Fight Club. And, and it's hard for me to, even though there are a lot of Leonardo DiCaprio films that I can appreciate, I, they wouldn't be the first movies that I would come to, that would come to mind if you say, oh, what are some of your favorite films? You know what I mean? Does that make sense? Sure. Do, you have, do yeah. you have actors like that? Like, you like them, but they just, they don't necessarily do a lot of stuff that you're into. I mean, maybe that's me. Yeah, maybe I'm just weird in that way. But sure, I don't know that I sort them that way. I mean, I, I would sort of Brad Pitt's kind of that way. Like I've I don't have anything against Brad Pitt, but I don't. He is not a draw for me to a movie. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, do you want to go see the new Brad Pitt movie? Um, I'd be like, but if you said, do you want to go see the new um, Leonardo uh, DiCaprio? No, I, who's, I'm sorry, I'm spacing on the guy's name, the director of Once Upon a Time in a Tarantino. Oh, Quentin He said, Tarantino. you want to go see the new Tarantino movie? Yeah. I'd probably be like, oh, okay, I'll check that out. Oh, Brad Pitt's in it. Oh, cool. Right. You know, but if you were like, do you want to go see the new Brad Pitt movie? I'm like, I don't know, what's it about? Like, it, he himself is not enough of a draw any more than uh, Keanu Reeves is. Mm -hmm. Like, if you said, you want to go see the new Keanu Reeves movie? I'm like, tell me more about it <laughs> before... Now, I don't know that if you said, do you want to go see the new Leonardo DiCaprio? I don't know that there are actors that I per se. You know what I mean? Do you want to go see the new Tom Cruise movie? I kind of be like, oh, is it a sci-fi thing? Then probably because those have been pretty. You know what I mean? I don't know. Yeah, I don't really the actor or the new Tom Hanks thing. I'm kind of like, I'm always going to ask, what's it about? I'm not going to just be like, oh, I'll go see anything this or that actor does, you know? Right. So I guess kind of, and I'm, you know, I'm probably in the minority in this regard since he's done so many uh, dramatic things that he's received acclaim for that, you know, I'm over here kind of like, oh, I would like to see him do more comedy because I think he's really great at it, you know? Well, did you see Django Unchained? Yeah, so the same thing. He's funny in that as well. So I, I and guess he's it's... certainly not a comic character. Right? He's a terrifying no. character. But yeah. there are, you know, in Tarantino, it's very bloody. It's very violent. It's very harrowing, and he really weaves in a bunch of absurdist comedy, almost impossibly. You know, some people will say it's too low. It's it's this is. Some people would think his filmmaking is disgusting, mm -hmm. like because you you know. You can't do a, a movie that really addresses slavery in the way that you address it and do those exploitation things with that topic. You know, you can't get laughs in the slavery movie or you can't, I don't know. I, I people, different people will say lots of different things. But to me, that kind of comes like, like it's a Quentin Tarantino movie. Like, right. I don't know what were you, you were thinking this is 12 years a slave. No, it's, yeah. it's Quentin, Quentin Tarantino. It's going to be exploitation. And that's the thing where I would say I'm a, I'm definitely a Quentin Tarantino fan because I've loved almost everything that he's done. And I'm, I'm not really a Martin Scorsese fan in that there are, there are Martin Scorsese films that I like, 
but I'm just not a massive fan of his, you know, his filmography sure. overall. Whereas, you know, and I, and it's, it's, that's just me. It's, I know that people love smart Scorsese and that doesn't mean that his films are bad. They just don't appeal to me often. I do. I, I'm one of you those know? people that really, really digs. So if you, if you said, do you want to go see the new Scorsese movie? I'd probably be like, Oh, okay. Yeah. You know, For me, it. I would be you like, know, what's it's not, it about? you know, it's not going to suck. Right. You might not like it. You might not yeah. think it's one of his best, but it's the same thing with, you know, he's just a filmmaker that knows what he's doing. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, if you say you want to go see the new James Cameron movie. You know, Titanic might not have been your cup of tea. It's a romance. It's a trap. You know, this is not one of my favorite of his films, but you can't say you're hard pressed to make the argument that it was not a well-made film. Oh, right? sure. I mean, there are some directors that are just at the top of their game. Spielberg. No, it's going to. Is it get, AI? Is that your favorite Spielberg movie? It's probably not anybody's favorite Spielberg movie. But I love AI, though. It's but yeah, but, but you know, there's going to be you're going to walk away from it, taking something away from it because uh, they know what they're doing. Yeah, for sure. And that's that we probably talked about this before on the uh, on the show, but a little side tangent with with James Cameron that. I'm continually seeing stuff where people are saying, oh, uh, the new, when, when the new uh, avatar comes out, <laughs> it's going to bomb. And it's just like, at this point, you can't. When, when is it going to come out? Nobody's going to remember the original one by the time this finally, I mean, is he sitting, is he making like eight movies? But he's making a what? bunch in a row, but it's like. How long this, has it been? Has it, it been 20 years yet? Since maybe avatar? 15. But at this point, it's like, you cannot count James Cameron out. You know, it's like people are like, oh, Titanic, nobody's going to care about that. And when Avatar came out, and at this point, you just kind of have to assume this is probably going to be the biggest movie that's, you know, ever. Isn't because. it funny how fickle, how fickle the industry can be? You know, it's like, it really is. It's like social media, you go away and you're working on something and you fall out of the conversation and people are just like, oh, I don't know, maybe he went crazy. Maybe he's on drugs or mm -hmm. like, no, maybe he's working on a big project. Like you can't go away for too long or people forget all about yeah. you. It seems like, but, but I, I mean, I haven't seen it... any buzz on it. Like who is he? He must have actors, right? I mean, oh, he he's, does. He's yeah. Shooting these things. Is he even in production? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think they've shot. I'm, I'm just going off the top of my head on this, but I think they've shot all three, and uh, I think it's three or four more. I don't know, but it's. Can you imagine four more movies? I get four movies that I'm just going to put out. What one every year or what? <laughs> I don't all know. At but once, it, but it's James Cameron. I mean, it's just like he is going. You know, you know, he's developed new cameras and new uh yeah processes that we this haven't is, seen that's what they did with lord of the rings right it was every christmas was the next one mm -hmm. so you saw it and then they rolled the next one out same time slot the following year and the same time slot the following year i mean even if you shot all four simultaneously you'd be a full to put them out like on netflix all of, you wouldn't make them all available all at the same time you want to no. milk each one for for as much as you can while you're talking i'm looking at what the uh so avatar 2 kate winslet's in it um it is set for next december it's in post-production so that's avatar 2 and i wonder if it's going to be 3d that's the thing, you know, 3D doesn't really seem to be a thing anymore. So Avatar 2, 2022, Avatar 3, 2024, Avatar 4, 2026, and Avatar 5, 2028. Wow. So. But. Okay. I don't know. I, I, I would, if I could put money down right now to bet on, do some kind of a bet about these films, I would say they're going to be gigantic. I don't care how long it's been since. Well, I mean, you no. think, well, what would it take for these things to flop? 
Um, and you're like, I, I mean, climate collapse, you know what I mean? Like if, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> if global economies fell apart, then you're like, well, nobody's going to the movies because everybody's just, you know, in the middle of yeah. this Mad Max reality, we're all in now to survive. Um, but I guess that's the gamble you take these days. Exactly. So anything else about uh, Don't Look Up? How do you, so let me ask you this. Are you, are, do you typically, I think, so this has been pretty hit or miss as far as people liking this or not. It's, it's, I think it's like a 45% on Rotten Tomatoes. Mm. Um, I think it a little better than that. Yeah. But I think political satire is something that people either like or they don't. I mean, satire in general is, I think, difficult to do well. D movies like Dr. Strangelove and Network and Bob Roberts, do you enjoy those, those films? Typically that kind of stuff? I guess not. Okay. I mean, I appreciate them, but enjoy being the key word is like the on the nose comment. Like it's sort of a, I, I'm not a hundred percent sure we mean exactly the same thing by on the nose, but like if you did a movie that was more about the president character and about how, um, right. I already know these things. You're not teaching me anything. It's mm -hmm. the same joke. And you're just repeating it to be like, isn't this crazy? And I'm like, yeah, it's been driving me insane for the past how many years now? Like, I don't, this isn't taking me away from it, taking me on a ride, making me feel hopeful or sad or science. You know, it's not an escape. It's just, it's like, sitting with your friend and yelling at each other about the latest political gaffe or something on which you both agree which is a thing it's really fall, holding a mirror up to that yeah that's one thing that i, I fall into that a lot i'm like why am i yelling at you about this over a beer because you and i agree on it and i'm just getting angrier the more i do it so there was a there's a little bit of that to this where it's like the more they were playing up the satire and the more absurd it got. You know, one thing that this movie did that we don't really see is the Jennifer Lawrence character, the DiCaprio character, they, they each had a moment where they completely lost it on camera. And mm -hmm. they just, for the Lawrence character, it happens very early on. And uh, the DiCaprio character takes longer to come to it. But and they're both on air when it happens where they're just they're just yelling like we're trying to tell you the truth like why well, i don't why are, why do, why am i the bad guy why do you hate me all i'm trying to do is tell you the truth and yelling and screaming and ranting and raving and nobody cuts the mic or cuts away and you don't see the fauci's doing that you don't see the they express their frustration but nobody loses it in that kind of a rant which feels, you know, particularly indulgent in a movie context, like, oh, don't you wish someone would sort of do this? Yeah. And I think my first reaction is like, yeah, I wish somebody would do that. But then my second thought is like, well, but all of us and all the people I know are kind of doing that to each other anyway. What good would that, like, would somebody with whom I already agree on screen losing their composure make me feel better or would they just you know, spin it against, I don't know. You know what I mean? So did I enjoy and they're definitely, it? I thought it was good. Uh, I haven't gone back to rewatch it. You know, I haven't had the impulse to go back and rewatch any of it. And they're definitely, he is not trying to present any kind of a balanced viewpoint or anything here. He's clearly no. saying one side is right and one side is wrong. So you so right are, there, you're going to use, you're going to lose half of your audience. You know, exactly. You're gonna get a, yeah. So I'm it sure there are people who, the people who review it because they don't agree with the politics. Yeah, I'm sure there are plenty of people as wide an audience as Netflix has who started to watch this and were just like, oh, this is, they're attacking me, basically, you know? Right. Uh, I imagine there was plenty of that, people who were, uh, you know, who didn't even get all the way through it and were just like, oh, this is, uh, and so there's certainly a, it's definitely preaching to the choir yeah so yeah but it's it's really great performances all around 
you know, it's well directed. Um, the another criticism is the length. It's over two hours long, which is long for comedy. I didn't really feel that didn't really bother me much. I, I didn't really feel like there was a lot that I would cut here. It didn't uh, feel I, bloated or it didn't feel like it dragged to me. Yeah. Either. I mean, and it's very capably made, right? It's well shot. Yeah. Um, my favorite part of it was the stuff, like you said, like the little interpersonal stuff, like the general scamming them out of the money. And that never gets explained. <laughs> you know, they never get to the bottom of that. Or Right. Um, why he decides to have the affair in particular and his wife takes him back. Like that was a lovely little human and we got to see how hurt she was by that and how upset she was by that. But that also felt true also that we saw that she really loved him and that when he said he was sorry that she believed him and understood that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like she just, so often we see this idea of one spouse uh, is unfaithful to the other and that is supposed to be relationship ending on every level. Like it is just, how dare you? And there's no forgiveness. And I just don't think human beings operate like that. And people are unfaithful to each other for all different kinds of reasons. And it's complicated. I think this brings up, you know, and I don't even know that he was trying to, to bring up this question, but um, there's Chris Rock has a line, something about that, that men are only as faithful as their options, something along those lines. I'm, I'm probably butchering that line, but you know, he's this regular guy who is suddenly thrust into sort of superstardom. And it, it's interesting how, and I don't know if this was, um, you know, with this film, it, there, you could maybe make the argument that Adam McKay is trying to say too many things, but uh, Leonardo DiCaprio becomes, he's just this. And, and another thing that I, uh, that I liked about this, I felt this was a very different character for Leonardo DiCaprio because he's, he's this neurotic, just nerdy scientist. And that's not typically, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio typically plays these kind of confident, you know, roles. So I thought it was interesting to see him as someone very not confident in a lot of ways, yeah. but he becomes, uh, I forget what they call him, but it's like the, what is it? You know, it's like MILF, but uh, SILF <laughs> or something like that. I don't forget yeah, what it scientist, is. Yeah. Scientist, yeah. Scientist, yeah, or BILF, like biologist. I mean, he's not a biologist, but uh, I forget exactly, but it's like, you know, he becomes this superstar Whereas people get mad at Jennifer Lawrence and she's this kind of hated figure. And, you know, I don't know if he was trying to play into misogyny there or not. I mean, it's not, uh, there's not a lot of commentary on that, but. Um, but you're right. He does. He touches on a bunch, a whole bunch of stuff. And there doesn't seem to be a lot of clear cut spoon feeding of a thesis on this or that but it does raise a lot of the echoes of me to me we're talking about it i mean to me right. that's conversation to be had but you wonder you know it's this thing of okay here what happens to a regular person when they are thrust into this spotlight and um i mean you don't know what a person could be very faithful to their spouse. And then if all of a sudden you're raised to this different level that you've never experienced in your life, you don't really know exactly what you would do. Right. Um, so and that I becomes, think, kind of I think in some ways that can become a kind of a, you know, in a microcosm, that's like, so what would you do if you found out you only had six months to live and everybody like the whole life on earth was going to end in six months? Yeah. What would you do? The, the pressure of that kind of impending change, you know, you might do crazy stuff that you would never have anticipated. If you were asked that question, theoretically, you might answer in one way and then finding yourself in that situation act very differently. And I think that, you know, what would you do if you suddenly became famous, globally famous and, and had the attention of these other glamorous, high 
profile people that you might never have considered yourself, you know, in the league of suddenly, you know, accept you as one of them and find you, you know, what kind of intoxication, what, what, what kind of effect would that shift have on your, and we see that every day from people becoming YouTube stars or hitting the lottery or the people's lives. It's one of the stories we love is the sort of Cinderella story. And right. <laughs> ironically, I feel like more often than not, certainly on the lottery thing, it destroys your life. I just <laughs> right? had this conversation We're all with somebody hoping for this change, but the change, if you look at the track record of it, certainly financially, it, it ruins your life. I just had this conversation with somebody the other day and, and, you know, I've had a lot of times I've had people say the same thing to me and where they say, oh, if I won the lottery for a hundred million dollars or whatever, I would continue going to, I would continue working. I'd still do my job. No, you wouldn't. You know, the first time the alarm went off, you'd be like, I don't have to go and do this work, you know, but people think, oh, my life wouldn't change that much. I would just have this money now, you know, but you know, it would, it would change in ways that you can't even imagine probably and the same thing if you overnight became famous you know yeah some people can handle that and some people can't i think most can't yeah you know and i think the people that can handle it or the instagram version of them is that they are handling it with a plum and it's just no big whoop but i i don't think that navigating because it's such an unnatural life you've got handlers and assistants and paparazzi and there's the the image you're trying to project and the image you're trying to hide and it just feels it's they exhausting touch on that even talking and, about it they touch on that a good bit in this movie with kind of everybody where it's like when they're first thrust when leonardo DiCaprio and jennifer lawrence are first thrust into the spotlight the the people around them are saying oh we need to get you media training you know and again it's like if you're just a regular person who isn't used to being on television how do you deal with that if you suddenly right. are all right. over TV, you know? So, so would you recommend it? I would, re you know, I would recommend it with the caveat of if you like some of the other films that we've mentioned here a little bit, like Dr. Strangelove and Network and, and those kind of things. I don't know that this will necessarily stand alongside those, you know, Dr. Strangelove, we weren't born when it came out because uh, I think that was like late sixties. Um, and the same thing with network was like early seventies, I believe maybe around like 1975. So this is so much a commentary on what's happening right now that I don't know that 10 years from now, this would resonate the way that it does right now. But, um, uh, I liked it, you know, I, I thought it was funny. Uh, I can definitely see where people could see this as mean spirited, um, but I would recommend it to people who like political satire, basically. If, if you're not interested in that, probably stay away. I agree. I, I agree with that almost uh, to the latter. I, I mean, I guess recently I've been watching shows like Boba Fett and, you know, I, I've been watching stuff that I want. I, not that it, I like stuff to be good, but me sitting down in front of the TV has been mostly escapist recently. If it's this ever, is not escapist. Yeah. I mean, this is just, holding up a mirror to what's happening. And basically Adam McKay, like I say, I, I felt like he was very angry and he's just saying, won't people listen to sanity? And it's like, Hey, other people who agree with me, see, you know, don't you agree that people should be smarter and listen and, if you don't want that message, you're, you're not going to like this. Right. I, I would yeah. say for me, I have not been able to, where it's a little bit escapist to me is the fact that it's funny. You yeah. know, you're dealing with these heavy, and it, it's sad at times um, with this film, but it's still treated mostly with humor. Whereas something like, I don't know if you've watched, is it is it called Station Eleven? Um, are you familiar with that? It's an HBO show and it's about, there's a pandemic and it's the aftermath of that and everything. Oh, and the, no, I haven't watched that. It's supposed to be fantastic. It's based on a novel or a series of novels, but um, that's the kind of thing that I can't, that's too, too real for me. Uh, so this is the kind of commentary on 
what's happening in our society right now that I I can handle. I it's escapist enough. I don't want to. If this were just a straight drama, I don't think I would have liked it because it would have been too depressing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. No. So I mean, that's our review. Um, Chris and Chris talk movies at gmail.com. Maybe you're watching us on YouTube right now. Maybe you're listening to us as a podcast. Either way, thank you so much. Uh, like, subscribe, uh, leave a comment, make a suggestion. Um, all the socials, etc. cetera. Uh, next time we were going to be talking about Saturn three sci-fi movie with um, Kirk Douglas and Farrah Fawcett and Harvey Keitel. Harvey Keitel, uh, set in space, and it, that was done in 1980. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're talking about for next time. Um, hope you will join us then. Anything else to add, Chris? I don't think so. Then we will talk to you next week. <laughs>